always loved where documentary and fiction met, and uh, like Rob said, in Italian neorealism to um, Sati Jeet Ray in India to um, more recent Our Dead Brothers in Belgium. I mean, the whole idea of mixing fiction and documentary has is, is always been part of, of cinema. So um, I knew I wanted to f use non-actors because no actor spoke Yiddish. So when I found Menashe, I wanted to make something that was easy for him. So with non-actors, you, you just change the part to fit what they are personally and then go from there. So once I started writing the script based on his life story, you know, his, his wife really passed away and he really lost custody of his son. Everything else, so this film is like the emotional truth about him. It's not the factual truth. I mean, there wasn't this rabbi who said he had one week. I mean, we made up kind of some script techniques just to fit it in the time frame of an 80 minute movie. But, um, uh, how it came into uh, yeah, so, so then it became Yiddish, right? So we wrote the whole thing in English just as like a 30 page list of emotional beats. And I worked with Musa Saeed, a Muslim writer, and Alex Lipschultz, who's also Jewish, and I went to college with him. So it was a very um, multi denominational group. I mean, we had Palestinians on set, it was a lot of different uh, opinions, which we're okay with, right? Nothing wrong with that. Um, so. Oh yeah. So anyway, so then what? Basically, we did the film in English. Then we got the set, and we had the actors um, play it in English, and then they'd switch to Yiddish. And we had people in another room talking to us in earpieces, telling us what they were saying. So it was kind of like pure directing in the sense that I looked at their eyes, I heard how they were speaking, and that was how I was able to give people um, direction. And then if they were saying the wrong words, we, we switched the words. But it wasn't really about the words. It was about just them being present and being open and available to the moment. Can you tell us a little bit about how it ended up, the actual uh, process of translation? I saw there's two names on there who are credited with uh, bringing it into Yiddish, which are Ari Mendel and, and Shulam Dean, who are uh, well known to people who are in the world of kind of, uh, they're prominent figures in the off the derrick sort of, uh, the the, those who leave the uh, ultra orthodox world and specifically in the Hasidic world community as the, the people who are your your access point into Yiddish, how did that uh, relationship develop and how did that work out in terms of creating this? Sure. So we had um, three people who were very involved from the community. One was Danny Finkelman. Danny Finkelman makes um, he works with a guy named Lipa Schmelzer. Lipa Schmelzer is the Lady Gaga of the Hasidic world. He sold out Madison Square Garden. He, Go check him out on YouTube. Um, Danny Finkelman makes like these amazing music videos with him. So he was my first entree into the world. So he actually introduced me to a lot of incredible people. And then Ari and Shillam, and, and Shillam wrote this great book called All Who Go Do Not Return about how he left the community. Anyway, Shillam is Menashe's brother-in-law, and, and Lipa Schmelter is also Menashe's brother-in-law. So it's just kind of funny how um, Menashe is part of this very uh, diverse artistic world, still living in that, that community. Um, but... Oh, okay, so yeah, so the fact is that they left the community. You know, they were really excited just to show an authentic viewpoint from it. I mean, this is an honest take of the world. It's not trying to whitewash anything, but it's also not trying to villainize people and say, oh, everyone in this community is child molested pedophiles. I mean, yes, that that is a group, but at the same point, that's not everything. And, and for me, as writing this story, I want to tell something about, from the thesis statement, it's about characters who choose not to leave. In the Western world, it's so easy to look on to closed societies and be like, oh, why don't you leave? Why don't you go if there's issues? But I thought it was way more interesting to write as a storyteller to tell a story about someone who never thinks of leaving and what, and what choices they make because of it. That's interesting because it's complicated in the sense that the people who are helping you develop the script and are working with you on the script are people who have actually made the decision to leave the community. While the script itself focuses, the plotting focuses on there's never a possibility of leaving this community, or that's not brought up. In fact, our, our central character has no interest in leaving, and it is, and it's fairly uncritical of, of the community itself. Right? We have the scene where he specifically is perfectly fine with them, um, you know, expelling a child from the school, and um, because his family, part of his family, has left the community. But yet, at the same time, you have this kind of point of contact here between people who have left the community. Uh, very um, loudly, uh, I would say, and um, and very provocatively, and written provocative works about it. And yet, the film itself centers around the people who choose to stay, and that's an interesting kind of complicated um, mix of things that you're bringing up here. Um, and I wonder if that um, also influences who ends up seeing the film. You know, I do find that um, non-Jews and Jews alike want to see it. I mean, everyone is fascinated by this world, and and people say like. National Geographic 
hasn't even made a film as um, intimate as this about the Hasidic world, because it wasn't possible. I mean, literally, I tried to make documentaries before this about the world, and you'd get shut down, you'd be closed off. I mean, you had to actually fictionalize it to tell it as authentically as possible. Mm. And I think all, all the people we worked with had that buy-in, that they wanted this to get out to the outside world. They wanted to share their story. This is the only way possible to do it. But that's an interesting point then about the National Geographic piece of this, I think, then, um, that in terms of it being ethnographic and being about a community, an insular community that is sort of cut off from uh, the mainstream world. And there's a, a couple of things I'd like to ask you about that. One is um, just my sense of it is that the, about the actors in the film uh, who are from the Hasidic world have also not interacted, if I'm not mistaken, with cinema um, and perhaps have never seen a film um, and how did that process of uh, that kind of ethnographic lens of when you bring in the camera and the, and the crew and you're shooting this film, how do you explain what this is gonna look like and what it means to have an audience of 200 or so people watching this film? What, what does that mean? Uh, Just to understand this, like Menasha had never been in a movie theater in his life until he went to Sundance. So the first time he went to a movie theater was like a packed audience <laughs> cheering from him. And, and just to understand as well, like, he really didn't get the movie. You know, when we were making it, he thought it was so inside baseball. He thought it was so specific. He's like, why would, you know, non-religious Jews, let alone non-Jews, want to watch this movie? And I kept on trusting Nash. I'm like, look, people really care to know about you. They really, as long as we're honest, as long as we have integrity, people will care. You know, and at Sundance that day, like he was crying. He was, he, it was like his whole life was waiting for this one moment just to share it with everyone else, and it was really special. Um, but for these actors, no, I don't know if you guys have seen any Bruno de Mont movies, he's a French filmmaker, but he purposely picks actors who actually have different physical disabilities, like Tourette's, other things, and they're incredible. You can't look away from his films because everyone does think, all the actors do things in movies that um, real actors couldn't do. So really, I just have to be open and, and, um, and take a breath and just let what was there work for itself. And you fought it as much as possible at the same point you had to just accept certain things. So it was really about the casting. I mean, the casting was hysterical. I wore a yarmulke, grew my beard out, put a white shirt, black pants on, went into the world, and just talked to people all day long and just observed them and took a camera out and screen tests with them. And, um, you know, I would change parts to fit people. Like, like the, um, the boss character was completely different. When he came in for the screen test, I was just blown away. He really was a boss. I mean, this is what it was in itself. And, and I just laughed, then I laughed, and I'm just like, you be you, I got something for you. And that was constantly it. Um, the, the woman who gives the gefilte fish recipe, I mean, I thought the kogo recipe, she's my friend's aunt. Um, and she was perfect. Uh, but everyone was perfect. You know, I, the, the rabbi, he basically is a rabbi, but never practiced. He's a religious cab driver, you know? So <laughs> this was his dream his whole life, was just to be a real rabbi. And, uh, <laughs> So whenever he's just like humming to himself and saying these sermons, I mean, he's been writing these sermons in his head for the last four decades. Um, anyway, so it's kind of like just just being open to what was there and constantly re revising, revising, revising. This is totally non-traditional. Like we shot the film, we did we shot two weeks, then we took four months off and rewrote and shot again. You know, so we constantly were just understanding what this world could provide us and then responding to it in, in what we had. Um, in the bathroom out there, there's a Cassavetes poster, you know, and, and, and um, there's two films, Woman Under the Influence and Husbands, which I really was inspired by making this film, especially Woman Under the Influence because, you know, Gina Rollins, who plays this mentally disturbed woman who's trying to take care of her kids, and I really related that to Menasha, that, like, this is how the world responds to, the, the world responds to Menasha, just like they responded to Gina in that film, and, and um, but did you think they bring a woman under the influence? I'm interested in also in the um, in women in this film. Um, the center of the film certainly relates to an absence of a woman, um, and in traditionally, and obviously in any traditional uh, Jewish specifically community, we often have a conflict in terms of how we uh, can represent women. Uh, there's famously, you know, a number of years ago, about a decade ago, there was a Hasidic film that kind of made the circuit called Gish a Gesheft a film that was in Yiddish by a uh, Yiddish community, which has, of course, n no women in it, and in fact, the corpse of a woman is played by, uh, with the hand of the corpse of a woman is played not by a woman. Um, and in this film, of course, there are women, and there is, uh, of all the things, a, a woman's voice singing in the film, 
which uh, indicates scandalous. Yeah, I mean, the scandalousness of this also indicates that this is not necessarily going to ever be seen by the community that uh, is being depicted in the film, which is a con another kind of your National Geographic kind of conflict. But I'm wondering about um, this, this absence of women, and what it meant to show women in this film and to have women characters. So, Menasha wrote on the Yiddish Wikipedia, which there is a real thing, that this is not a film for religious people. I actually, I actually have the quote in Yiddish. He oh, said, yeah, no, he said, the film is gespielt durch fremde Jeden, doch, uh, doch is es original, uh, original geeig, uh, geeigent für dem sekulare Welt. So he said, specifically, <laughs> this film, um, while it's played, uh, the actors are all played by, uh, by religious Jews, of course this film is definitely originally meant entirely intended for a secular audience. <laughs> no. So <laughs> sums up. But the whole idea of women, obviously the film at its heart is about a, a, a husband who's conflicted about the loss of his wife. So I mean it's really important and there are many, many conversations in the writing and the shooting and the editing of the film about the relationship of women in the story and how to portray them in an honest way. So we had to show enough women in this script to obviously be honest, but at the same point, you know, women aren't part of the world. I mean, if you're telling a man's story, this is honestly how women are shown in the world, unless they're married. If they're married, then obviously they have lots of communications with women, but if they're not married, this is it. They have a few people. They have a cousin and a, and a neighbor and a, and a great date that you get. I'd like to open this up to uh, anyone who would like to ask a question. I see sure. To repeat the question. The question that was the question that was asked just now was uh, the um, the actor the that who plays uh, Riven the the child is the grandson of the uh, the a famed professor of Yiddish uh, Yitzhak Naborski and uh, the question points out that the Yiddish sounded very different from the other people speaking Yiddish and I'm wondering about the provenance of this child actor and uh, and about how to reconcile the differences of their pronunciation. So we, we explained it in the script that his wife was from Israel, so this is more of an Israeli type, type of Yiddish. She does have a couple words in Hebrew. Um, what? She does have a couple words in Hebrew. Yeah, yeah. Um, so if you but, sneak them in. Uh, yeah. But I mean, so yeah, Ruben, it was a miracle of the Pakistan. There's nothing more perverted than three grown men walking around Bro Park trying to convince moms to give us their kids for a movie. <laughs> you know? It's just... So when we found Ruben and we did our first screen test with Ruben and with Menasha, um, it was made clear that Menasha saw his own son within Ruben and that there was this heartfelt connection that was emotionally true and, and you couldn't create. And I knew that from that, from that first time they met, that we could hold a film together with them no matter what happened. Yeah. Yes, right here, the woman in black here. Yes. I just want to say that I've only seen two films to the festival. One was The Woman's Balcony, which is, of course, has many, many women in it. And this, and the dissonance that I experienced uh, as a human being, I thought the films were both uh, wonderful and, uh, and very nice to go into that world. The other thing that made me smile build a balcony to separate the women and keep them apart. <laughs> and you're rooting in this one for a child to be raised in a world where he can't even grieve his own mother. You know, you see it, it's a picture, put it away. And it was none of the ability to do that. So I find it so strange that as much as I got into it, I have that part of me that just is like this. Respectful, caring, but the part of me that roots 
I'm glad you're conflicted, that means we succeeded. I know. Yes, oh. we talk about they giggle, they giggle. In my family, I always thought it was kegel. My brother said it was kugel. We're, we're going to put aside the debates between the Litvakis and the Galicianos for a, a later screening. Yes, right here. Yes. Okay, well, we're going to put dialect questions yeah. to the side for a second, but let's... But, but my real question is, yes. this, the, the Ruben was phenomenal. I mean, he really jumped off the, the screen, and I'm just curious if there's, if, if he has any... Ask, I mean, is he, he still lives in this community? No. Um, Ruben lives in Israel. He doesn't live in, in the Orthodox community. Oh, okay. No, I, just, yeah. I mean, I just think he's incredibly yeah. talented. Okay. Yeah, well, well the, the key is Skittles. One skill for every good take, you lose a skill for a bad take. And it's where it works every time. Skittles. With gelatin, yes. Hi. No kosher ones, actually. Yeah. Uh, I'm from Muncie, which is right near yeah. Square. And you, you know Menasha? I know Lipa. Okay, Lipa. Okay, and whoever doesn't is not familiar with the Square community, it's even more closed off than a lot of the other communities. And so much so, we're actually Lipa was yeah. kind of... So, so you're just talking about where Menashe is from, you understand. Where Menashe lives, it's in New Square, it's 20 miles north of GW Bridge. It's one of the poorest cities or towns in America. Everyone's on food stamps, most people are on public housing. Um, there's one road in and one road out, and um, it's you know, per capita, it's yeah. one of the poorest places in America. Uh, right, but not really. Not really. Not really. <laughs> it isn't. So, uh, the, but we're going to get to the question in a second, but just the back, background here of the question is that the, uh, that Menashe is uh, from, originally from New Square, or the Square uh, Facetic community, um, which is a community uh, close to where the, which, this man right, is asking. Which tells me how unbelievable of a job you must have done <laughs> to actually get them to do this. Yeah. Because what follows is, is going to be a firestorm, which is a good thing. So the no, question, it's not a good thing. Well... I, I, I'll tell you why I think it's a good thing. No. Okay, so um, I go to a movie in Muncie. You see a ton of guys there, right, or a Yankee game. And they're wearing the vest or even a white polo shirt with pants under the Yankee cap. Yeah. And you're like, I, I know you're, you know, they, you know. So what this actually shows is that it, not every Hasidic family or not every that you see walking down the street is this hairy, smelly guy. You can give him the mic. So the, the, the basis of this question is about the insularity of the Sphere community is so striking that when this film is, per, is shown to audiences that there must be a huge kind of, uh, you know, a firestorm, as you put it, against the, the kind of the, this kind of public display of what's happening inside the community. Have you been faced with you know, that? People in that community are, again, and, you know, there's over 40 different Hasidic groups. Besides the Lubavitch and the Chabad movement, all the other 39 are very, very insular. And, and they're not going to like this film. Um, a lot of them will, will watch it. The they want to watch it. Watch. What? Which, which Hasidic group would watch the movie? Only Lubavitch is the only one that would. And not all of them, only a minority of those people. Most Hasidics would not watch this movie. I'm so we're going to take, yeah. take one last question, and, uh, and then we can uh, meet after and talk more. So the question here is about the public presentation of women within the community. That we hear, we see a number of issues about uh, that are brought up or touched upon in the film about the role of women. But the question here is, are there public roles uh, for women, um, or not public, but a, so it, what do they do uh, in this community? I think that's a very, very big question. Um, what was your second question?
So the question here, the second question here is, uh, which we'll close on, is this question about joy. So Hasidism is historically based on an idea about uh, of joy, of joyous uh, engagement with text and of with the world. Um, but uh, the question asks, where is the joy in this community? There seems to be a lot of um, kind of solemnity uh, throughout the film. Where where do you see and so where do it, you it's show so interesting, joy? Yeah, because actually this is a response to actually what we wanted to act from Felix and Mira here tonight and um, fill the void, not fill the void, but just the whole responses. Most of the city films show very stern look at the world, but actually I think Menasha finds levity everywhere and brings joy to him and his son multiple times throughout the film. So this is kind of a response in the sense that actually there is lots of joy in this world. There is there is joy through prayer. There's joy through celebration. There are um, huge religious celebrations that bring the community together. So I did try to show why, again, the thesis statement of this film was why do people stay, not why do people leave. So I thought, I mean, I, I totally appreciate if you feel there was no... Um, there's no levity in the movie, but um, I think there's lots of it. And if you listen to the crowd's laugh, it seemed like they did find it. And I'd just like to point out that one of the most beautiful things, scenes, I think, in the film was actually the scene at the park. Uh, there was that beautiful moment at the park where, it, uh, where we really do see this moment of um, a real, like, real kind of just pleasantness uh, between the father and the son here. Um, and it opens up onto this extremely multicultural, multi-ethnic city um, and all these different groups of people playing together in the park. And it's just an incredible vision of what New York looks like, but also our city in Los Angeles looks like, and just any city that has all these different groups who can come together and be in their enclaves, but also be out in the world. And I thank you for showing us a film like this. It was a, a beautiful film. Thanks so much, Emma. Thank you. And July 28th, coming to theaters, tell everybody you know. <laughs> and please be sure to fill out your uh, ballots. Um, and uh, like Hillary said, if you don't know what to mark, you should mark five. <laughs>